Welcome to I Drink Your Podcast, where we drink and talk about movies from 2007. Imagine my little girl, regular. Guys, did you see me dance? No, you wasted energy and time. I turned penis into gold. Are you okay? I want to see you naked. Surprise, dude, you got herpes. If I did, you were a ventriloquist. You really well dressed for a shadow puppeteer. What is he going to culturally appropriate this time? Mommy. I drink your podcast. I drink it up. Welcome to another bonus episode of I Drink Your Podcast. Thank you for joining us today. Today, I am joined by Emily. Hello, everyone. Wesley. We should really call these I Drank Your Podcast. Why is that? That's a fun, fun little twist on a bonus episode. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just the pitch. Hi, everybody. I'm Wes. <laughs> <laughs> and we also have Ben. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Glad to be here on this Valentine's Day recording. Happy Valentine's Day to you, too. As unto you. <laughs> Ooh, I liked that. <laughs> that was That was beautiful. And for this bonus episode, we are watching what I thought was a romantic comedy, which is Two Days in Paris. Uh, it did not exactly turn out the way I expected it. I don't know if either of those words are accurate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's start off with what is in your glass today? I just made a quick Manhattan. Um, I hit it a little hard last night. I, I don't think I've ever had a or made my own dry martini before. And uh, having two of those kind of. Let's just say when I woke up at 6 a.m. on the couch, I was like, what the what the hell just happened? <laughs> so just taking it easy with a Manhattan today. Yeah. Well, Wesley, I had a similar experience. So we for the listeners, we recorded a movie last night and we all got a little swifty. <laughs> <laughs> Vegas style. Basically, yep. yeah. And I ended up eating a lot of artichoke dip last night before I went to bed. And so I am just drinking some water this morning in recovery because my, my poop was not very nice to me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and Wesley, you should give yourself more credit for being on brand. The characters live in New York. I know. I thought about that too, but also, eh, because <laughs> isn't there another movie? We can get into it, but there, there's two days in New York, isn't there? Yeah. Which is actually a sequel to this yeah. movie. Oh, it's like legit a sequel. It's the same female character and the parents come back, but it's a different um, significant other. Oh, interesting. Well, I am drinking a nice French wine today in honor of Paris. Is it actually French? It is a French wine. It's a it's a Sauvignon Blanc and it's a nice bottle of wine from the TCM Wine Club. Shout out to Patrick Willems for convincing <laughs> me to buy that. And now I'm just drinking wine, not watching it with the movies. So. Not exactly what he had in mind, but thanks anyway. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of people to do that. <laughs> yeah. I was tempted. He's a good salesman. <laughs> so what have y'all been watching recently? I just got caught up in WandaVision. I'm assuming. Mm. I know Ben is caught up, but Wesley, are you caught up as well? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Okay, well, probably no spoilers here if you're listening, but if you do for some reason are like, I haven't even started it yet. Well, then you might not want to listen. But I really have been enjoying the intrigue and the mystery around it. It's very different and not what I expected from the MCU. I have gotten really bored with the MCU, honestly. I've just been... I haven't even watched most of the more recent movies, and so... Getting into this show and into this series, I've been having a really wonderful time with the different callbacks to silly TV shows from different decades and just the dynamic between Wanda and Vision. It's just been really fun for me to see something different. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think we've talked about it on, on a previous episode when uh, the first two episodes of WandaVision came out, but I totally agree that they're taking this in a direction that nothing else in the Marvel universe has ever got. I mean, there's always been references back to other things in shows, but the them doing it with characters that are already established and, and have a, a history and everything. And then getting to where it is now, it's, it's a fun journey. This is really hard to do completely spoiler free. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I was ready after Endgame to kind of wash my hands of the MCU. I felt like that story was kind of done and I was ready to just move on and not have to devote, you know, three movies a year to <laughs> right. keeping up and, and all these TV shows that were coming up. But with WandaVision just taking such a unique storytelling angle, like it, it's kind of pulling me back in. Like if they're going to continue to be this creative and tell these kinds of stories, I want to see where this goes. So I, that was not right. something I expected after Endgame. I completely think agree. 2020 also helped with that. I think we uh, collectively as a planet have uh, really stretched our exhaustion of entertainment. So I think anything mm. new is mm-hmm. is kind of nice. And I don't know, was WandaVision recorded before? Is this all happening? I have no idea. I assume uh, it's got to be a long time know. ago. But yeah, and anyway, I've, I found that when like anything new pops up these days, if it's decent, like great mm-hmm. I, like it's it's kind of rare for for new stuff right now because i think a lot of smaller companies or studios probably don't have the ability to even push forward right now or, or in the last couple of months so wesley have you watched anything new besides wandavision uh, i actually just started watching it's not super new i don't think i didn't check the timeline but i just started watching cobra kai oh yeah that's pretty newish yeah so i, I just finished the first season couple nights ago actually and there's a lot of like head shaking like oh that's cheesy like it's very predictable in a lot of ways but then like the other half of it is just it's still not unpredictable but they nail it so good with how the bad guy from the karate kid movies why he is the way he is how he would be as an adult and how he can they've kind of flipped it on its head how they didn't change him he didn't become a good guy but Mm -hmm. using his mentality and the lessons he was taught to be a bad guy to help kids who were struggling like with being bullied and giving confidence and all this stuff so it's it's really good <laughs> surprisingly and it's it's a uh, it's not one that's going to rack your brain it's not one that's going to take take a bunch of writing down notes and studying afterwards but it's yeah it was entertaining have it's you guys a seen nice it? ride Mm-mm. no i've never seen karate kid any of them I don't think you necessarily have to because they do a pretty on the nose job of literally splicing in flashbacks if there's Mm -hmm. something that's being directly referenced. See, the only thing that I get are weird, bizarre references to I don't even know what the hell his name is. uh, The main character in there. Oh, Daniel Russo. Daniel son. The bad guy. I don't I don't know his name. Oh, Zorb Zorbka Zabka. I think sure. The, the only name. thing that I know of in this whole Karate Kid universe is from references in other shows or other movies when they make references to the Karate Kid. So, for example, like How I Met Your Mother, Barney's character is obsessed with that character. Johnny Lawrence. Yeah, Johnny. Sweep the leg, Johnny. William Zabka. And that's probably one of my favorite things about this is I don't think anybody ever thought Ralph Macchio was a good actor. And especially as kids like him, Ralph Macchio plays Daniel LaRusso and then uh, William Zorbka plays Johnny Lawrence. And they, you know, did their best for acting as kids in the mid 80s. (laughs) They're still not great, but the difference between Ralph Macchio and William Zabka is ridiculous. And Zabka playing this alcoholic who's just like still just the same dick that he was in the same movie or in the movies. But like, it's okay. And like, I root for him. Like, it's it's very interesting. Yeah, we like underdogs. Well, I've been using this quarantine time also to catch up on shows that I kind of missed out on. Uh, So I got caught up on Chernobyl. I watched that. I really enjoyed that. Very well made. Your dog didn't. (laughs) My dog. No, he did not. That episode. Episode four. Yeah. With the dogs. He was barking like crazy. Like he was watching the dog Holocaust happen. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) <laughs> and then I also uh, watched all two seasons of The Boys in like a week and got super wrapped up into that. Yes. Love, loved every second of it. Yeah. Can't wait for season three. Who's your favorite? I'm very, super? very happy. Definitely The Deep. <laughs> you, you would like The Deep. Of course. He's he's so funny. Uh, I love his storyline, just where, where they're taking him kind of to, to the brink of being irrelevant and then trying to bring him back in the 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 fray yeah definitely gave you that he's he's got the biggest arc like the biggest swing 
I really love Homelander. I love how he has made his character. And I don't want to say any more than that. I just, I, it's delicious to me. Yeah. I love Aya Cash's character. Mm. See, I didn't at the beginning. No, but I think that's the point. Mm. Yeah, but you can like a character and still not kind of like them as as a person within the the show like i just didn't find her interesting at the beginning and i i think that wasn't the point yeah i think that wasn't the point i definitely disagree with you finding her not interesting because i immediately was all in because i was like oh what is gonna happen i don't i don't know the intrigue was there and then how they change things up and i don't want to spoil anything but yeah i totally agree with Maybe the execution for you wasn't quite as delicious as I found it, but I loved it. And maybe it was just the social media angle that turned me off. But that's because you don't have any social media, Ben. I don't. I I have no footprint at all. (laughs) So let's get into Two Days in Paris. It is starring Julie Delpy as Marion and Adam Goldberg as Jack. And this movie was directed, written and edited by Julie Delpy. And for a little background on this movie and uh, Julie herself, Julie's most well known for playing Celine in the Before trilogy. That'd be Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, and Before Midnight. And she has writing credits on the second and third movie of that trilogy because she developed her character so well and knew her character inside and out that the director invited the two lead actors in to help write the script because it's like, where do you think these characters would go? Hmm. Because what's really interesting about those movies is that Before Sunrise came out in 1995, and then nine years later, they came back to do the sequel Before Sunset, and then nine years after that, they came back to do the third one, Before Midnight. So it kind of tracks this relationship uh, across almost 20 years. Isn't that one of your favorite trilogies, Ben? It is. I, I really, really like those movies and just the way that it's all character and conversation driven. And you're really pulled into this relationship and can see it mature over time and the different challenges that different relationships can, can have as a result of people changing over time. Mm, Okay. Have you seen them? I haven't seen them. Okay. No, I haven't. So when I started watching this movie, I didn't, I didn't look it up at all beforehand. As soon as I saw Julie Delphi's name, like eight times in the opening credits, I was like, I bet I've seen this movie, quote unquote, already, mm-hmm. uh, and I didn't was not disappointed. But it's very different from from the before trilogies in that this movie seemed to explore a lot more of emotion and a lo- longer term relationship where the before trilogies, a lot of that conversation is around a lot more existential talk mm-hmm. and living in the moment because in the very first movie, they they meet by chance on a train, and I believe they have some sort of layover, so they just decide to walk around, and then they have to get on a train and go different ways. So there's this whole existential, what's the point of life, everything's fleeting, where this movie, rightfully so, had to do a lot more with like relationships, not just like in the moment love and and those bigger questions. Yeah, this movie is much more akin to Before Midnight, which, you know, by Before Sunset, they went their separate way in Before Sunshine. Nine years later, they happen to meet again and they they kind of rekindle things and and re-meet and see how they've changed over time. And then they decide to be together in that one. And then in Before Midnight, it's nine years into their their relationship together. and, And now you're really seeing cracks start to form between them and the different things that life is pulling them in different directions and the, mm. the, the the stress of a relationship is starting to weigh on them. And you see that. And that's really what we get in this one, which is a lot of that, that relationship stress and that trying to decide like, are you the person I should really be with? Got it. But instead of having two movies of character development, they cram it all into 140 minutes. Yeah. Hour and 40 minutes. With this movie, which was Delpy's directorial debut, She pulled inspiration from her real life in writing the story. The characters of her mother and father are played by her real life parents in this. Oh, who are both actors as well. My gosh, that's so wholesome and sweet. Mm -hmm. And even different characteristics of the parents in the movie were pulled straight from the mom and dad's real life. Like the mom 
not necessarily having had sex with Jim Morrison, but they mentioned some sort of group of like uh, like feminist revolutionaries that, yes. that she was a part of. And and that was true to life. She was actually part of that group. Did the dad also have a uh, erotic art style gallery? <laughs> you know, it wouldn't surprise me, but I did not I did not <laughs> come across that in my research, nor do I know if he has a, a penchant for keying cars who are parked on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love the dad. Yeah. Just like Delpy's character in this movie, Marion, Delpy also has very poor eyesight and little to no depth perception. So that's another thing that she kind of pulled in to this movie. But with this movie, she wanted to avoid a lot of the romantic comedy tropes that you typically see. So she actually didn't watch any in preparation. The main inspiration she had for this movie was Jaws because she wanted to create that tone where there's a sense of terror of a shark lurking in the water. And that's the <gasps> sense of terror she wanted to create in all the arguments that they had. Oh my gosh, this is just blowing my mind right now. And then, as I mentioned, Delpy was the editor of this, and that's because they ran into budget constraints. And she said it was cheaper to rent an editing bay for herself than to hire an editor. So it was more her taking that on because it was needed and not because she necessarily had a passion for it. I didn't think it was bad. I, I actually enjoyed the editing. Maybe you guys disagree. No, I, I don't think this type of movie needs some. And this isn't to discredit any editors out there. I truly don't know the entire scope of all the work that goes into editing a movie because it looked great. And so both not a dig at editors and not a dig at Julie. I don't think this is the type of movie that you need someone amazing. You just need somebody who is capable. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, it's really cool hearing about her journey as a filmmaker with this, because like I came in knowing zero any I didn't know anything about any of this. So this is cool, Ben. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. So let's get into the synopsis of this movie. And again, this is pulled straight off the back of the DVD cover. <laughs> so Jack is an anxious hypochondriac prone New Yorker vacationing throughout Europe with his breezy, free spirited Parisian girlfriend, Marion. When they make a two-day stop in Marion's hometown, the couple's romantic trip takes a turn as Jack is exposed to Marion's sexually perverse and emotionally unstable family, her coarse temperament with cab drivers, and her ex-lovers, her many ex-lovers. Culture-shocked and ego-bruised, Jack finds himself hoping that their relationship can survive as their love is revealed in surprising ways. Hmm. I don't know if I agree with any of that synopsis. <laughs> yeah his name was jack okay yes her name was marion yes they were in paris yes she was yelling at cab drivers mm -hmm. i don't know it just seems very jack focused yes and that is not really what i got out of the movie i guess no and you're introduced to this movie as marion is the narrator like that's how this movie starts is it's right. mostly from her perspective and I actually really loved that about this. That was the first takeaway that this was a narration that worked for me. In the beginning, in the beginning, in the beginning, the beginning, I was I, it was like refreshing. It was I wasn't expecting anything like this. I was expecting romantic comedy. And this was a nice change of pace. Well, that's because you haven't seen the before trilogies. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's it. That's fair. It's it is a different type of movie, but the fact that there already are, well, I guess before this movie came out, there were only two. But this wasn't new to me. But I, I want to go back a little bit and talk about the synopsis being Jack centric, because and maybe this is going a little bit too far into it, but I struggled with trying to understand who I'm supposed to support. Yes. Who is the protagonist? Especially, and it really hit home with me towards the end when they were arguing on the river bank, and he's going like it's it's all coming out, and he's saying like I I know you did this, I know you did this, and I really struggled right there. Like, am I supposed to be on Marion's side? And then she goes to exactly where he accused her of cheating. It's like so obviously. Marion is the narrator and is the main character, but is she supposed to be the good guy or is that not the point? I don't think that was the point. I think that the relationship obviously stood out to all of us. Their relationship was very nitty gritty. 
it had a lot of components of reality in, involved. And even Ben, you talked about the background of a lot of this from Delpy's experience and just like her writings and real life. And so I think it started off in a really good place of you don't know who to root for because that's not how relationships work. That's not how you're supposed to think like, this is the winner of the relationship, <laughs> you know? And so they they both had faults and you saw them right away, but they also both had ways that they wanted to protect one another and they showed their their quirkiness and their love for one another. In Jack's sarcastic remarks and and in <laughs> I think with Marion's passion, a lot of the time I felt like it balanced out where there was a lot of give and take, especially in the beginning. Yeah, and see, I I kind of disagree with that because Wesley's point of like you don't know who the protagonist is. If there's no given protagonist, then you need to be rooting for the relationship. And there was nothing about the way that the relationship that was established that made it seem like it was anything worth rooting for. Because Aww. you really you really see from the very beginning that they're already almost at each other's throats from the start. Like it's even teased that like the beginning of the European trip has not been going well for them. So it's like we're we're coming in where things are already frayed. So we're given no indication as to why this couple should even be together in the first place. I disagree. I felt like there was something about their banter back and forth where they still were respecting one another. And maybe that's just my own twisted way of thinking because I, I don't know. And maybe I just like fell into this weird hypnosis with their bantering back and forth. But the jokes that they were making with each other at the expense of <laughs> the racism in the world and Bush and Cheney and the American tourists, obviously there were some things that were flawed about their characters, but they both like still enjoyed each other's company. At least that's what I got from right from the beginning. Now, I would say... Up until the point where they go to the art gallery and then the party, Vanessa's party, and then they start having their big fight along the river, like you said, Wesley, I was still rooting for their relationship. I felt like it was very real and raw, where if you are traveling with someone, especially maybe this is their first time traveling together for real, it it brings up a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I think you both make some good points. I do think that the relationship is the part that is supposed to be the thing you're rooting for, but they don't really show it to us right away. And so, like Emily, you were saying them them bantering back and forth and kind of making fun of each other. And honestly, one of my biggest problems with this movie, and I wrote it down really early on, was I hate this movie. It's just constantly arguing. And even worse, I had to read it. And then it's just a <laughs> roller coaster between fighting and yelling making fun of each other and then laughing like that whole dinner scene with her parents i was just like this is i cannot follow this i i as an emotionally unstable human being can't track all of this but i do think that it also forced me to think you know i don't understand this relationship and why it's good but that doesn't mean that it's not good and everybody's got their different love language and how people want to interact with each other. So that was something I tried to pretty quickly, like you said, Emily, it's, it's hard at the beginning to notice that, but understanding that maybe there's something in there that I just can't grasp. Mm, I understand. And I'm glad you brought up that, that scene at the table where they're Is that with the, the rabbit with the rabbit. Yeah. Because up until that point, I was fully behind this movie. Like I, I loved the banter. I loved how funny it was, which is something that the before trilogy really isn't that funny. It's more existential and serious. So I was I was really in, but not because of the characters necessarily, but because I was I was all about Jack's culture shock at that point. Him being in this place where he doesn't understand the people and Marion's not cueing him into what the parents are saying, like she's hiding stuff from him. I was really into that. And then slowly after that, the layers start to get taken off on Marion's character and you start to see a bit of a rotten core. And it just became very off-putting, this movie, in the way that it presented Marion's personhood. And it made me start to question, like, why is Jack even with her? There are multiple points in this movie where I would have, like, yeeted the fuck out of there because you're acting completely irrational and I'm done with you. 
Interesting. I actually felt, and maybe this is because I'm a woman. I don't know. I just felt like he, let me back up. When I lived in Italy, I felt that culture shock and it was really hard to keep up. And I remember that my host family was trying to like cue me in, especially my first day there. I was at a table of like six to seven different large Italian families it was insane. And I had a really hard time keeping track of what was happening. But at the same time, I was exhausted from traveling. And so I really recognized that Marion was trying to support and protect her partner. But at the same time, I felt like Jack wasn't really being understanding of anything that was going on. Obviously, I've, I've been in that position and it was really hard. But I honestly felt like Jack was just being an ass once we started getting into this like I, I don't know. I just, I really didn't like him after a while. It just seemed like he was constantly complaining about literally everything and calling his partner fat and, and like start, it started getting mean spirited at, at a point. I did have a problem with those fat comments and they weren't just coming from him. They were coming from the dad as well. When this character is, was not fat at all, at least by American standards. Going back to that dinner conversation, Ben, it sounds like that was kind of a similar place where something happened in the movie that changed your opinion of of moving forward and for me it changed for the better because that's when the comedy started coming out for me and to emily's point of not maybe necessarily being on jack's side i think that knowing adam goldberg and the characters he's played and and stuff he's written for he's a very neurotic guy so i took all of that as like personal anxiety and not tourist so I, I think that probably helped me keep him at least not the bad guy for a little bit longer. But I, I do want to point out just more relatable. Yeah. Yeah. So specifically in that dinner scene, they're talking about uh, he's going to eat rabbit. And then he has a flashback to his childhood where he had a pet rabbit. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, I don't I can't eat it. And she's like, you don't have to. And he's like, oh, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then they start arguing. And it, like they, it's this familial conversation that sounds like it's heated because you don't understand the language but then Mm -hmm. the dad actually does say that she has a fat ass and then they actually do start to argue and it's just this real quick throwaway line from this paranoid adam goldberg in the background who's like but i'm eating the rabbit like (laughs) (laughs) right like he took on all the guilt of that conversation and was like no, like I'm, I'm, I'm doing what you're i'm supposed to be doing so and that's what like real families are like you know where at least when I was in Italy, I, I remember like not following. And then suddenly I was like behind, you know, I was behind mm-hmm. the conversation. <laughs> yeah. And then the follow up to that, just because I thought it was hilarious. They start dishing out the carrots. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then J- Jack goes, oh, now we're going to eat the bunnies food, too. Are the, are the, are the bunnies toys in there as well? <laughs> that was one of my favorite lines. I had that one written down. With the representation of jack and marion within this movie we also kind of get parallel representations of the american people and the french people as a whole and they really do mirror how jack and marion are presented like we meet the american tourists at the beginning who are like oh, code breakers. Da Vinci code. <laughs> yeah. and then later we get introduced to jack's obsession with that small world theory and chaos like the, the, they're, they're kind of mirrored in that way and then at the end we see the tourists again and it looks like paris is like beating the shit out of them well, like yeah, and gra- that was all graffiti Jack's fault. <laughs> it is Jack's fault, but it's also kind of what Jack experienced from Paris as well. Just not That's true, not in a physical sense, but more in a spiritual sense. But then in addition to that, the French people in this movie, which I've never seen a movie that had more disdain for the French people than this movie. Nothing about the way the French people are portrayed in this movie is anything like that makes me want to go there. They're all hypersexual and impulsive and angry. And not respecting of privacy and all of that, those same traits come through in the Marion character. Oh, so see, I actually, I love the hypersexual parts. I loved the lack of privacy parts because when you're growing up in a family and a culture like that, it just, it it made sense to me to see those cultural differences. And like they, they obviously hadn't had a time to work through those problems. And so I actually liked that that was being brought up. The lack of privacy that I'm specifically talking about is her showing the picture of his dick with the balloons to her family. That is not okay. Yeah, but it turns out that that wasn't just him. Like, that's just the thing she does with people. Still doesn't make it okay to share it with your parents and and sister. Yeah, but if your dad is a exhibition artist and 
you're a photographer who potentially takes nude art. I don't know. Yeah, see, that's how I thought of it. Like, obviously, there was a problem that she didn't tell him that that was my issue. And the fact that they have a copy. I did definitely have a problem with that. But like the fact that they well, might have seen it. Seven. And she probably sent it, what, 2005? She probably mailed it. I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I shouldn't try to defend it. But it, it was, it opened up the opportunity to have those deeper conversations where they weren't on the same page. And they thought they kind of were with their arguing. They thought it was cute banter. And then it started opening up like some more real deep conversations. Or at least that's what I hoped it was going to do. And then it just kind of spiraled out of control, in my opinion. Yeah, very out of control because that balloon picture was really the impetus for me starting to question like Marion as a as a person and a character because it's like you have this lack of respect for your partner. Like you you could ask him or tell him that you're going to do this. But why is he finding out from the sister pulling it out in a in a family meeting like that? Just that just seems shitty because that's a little sister thing or older sister thing to do. If that's why. But well, yeah, the little I get sister it. just made a joke about it. The dad is the one who pulled the photograph, which I think oh, is gotcha. It's all bad. <laughs> so I get where you're coming from, Ben, with the privacy thing. I'm still on the side of it's just kind of a cultural thing that, again, the lack of communication. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That's where that's, I was trying that's to go. Where I'm still kind of stuck in. Like, I understand your perspective and I totally agree that she should have asked before doing some shit like that. But like, <laughs> I know maybe it's just really fucked up. That this is my family. But if that was a picture of Corbin's dick with balloons tied and I send it to my dad without telling him, like, I would, of course, tell him. But like, my dad would get a, such a fucking kick out of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the long running problems in this movie that that stems from kind of that is one of the things that I've brought up multiple times in multiple episodes of this show. Just communicating and being honest could have fixed so many things in this movie where especially with the translation where Marion starts to later on like do it a little more often but especially like that dinner scene was the first time it was just smacked over the head with the fact that she'll she'll, and it was when she translated Jack's English to her dad but nothing that her family was saying she translated back to Jack I was like why why are you making this difficult on Jack like this is him out of place and he has no idea what's going on but just a lot of a lot of that stuff where we've already talked about you know marion maybe protecting him but it it was all deceit and and hiding things that i think should have been up to him to decide how to feel about it not her to decide what she he should know or not yeah and i i agree wesley i know you've said this quite a few times but that that's like the fundamental problem in a lot of relationships is communication and so i think in this movie they were trying to capitalize on the realness of that versus other quote unquote rom-coms just do a really shitty job of, oh, this is the hijinks so I didn't communicate kind of thing. It's glaringly obvious versus this is more, it has more depth in my opinion because of the reality. And I know I said that Marianne was probably trying to protect him, but also again, like trying to translate that quickly when things, the quips are coming and and going so quickly and you're trying to defend your partner and defend yourself from your family. But at the same time, you're trying to like have another conversation in another language with someone else. I can see that being hard, but again, they still have a fucking problem later where she doesn't like go through and analyze everything and explain everything. You know, I, I get it. I mean, and she didn't have to translate word for word during that dinner. And even if that's the case, that the family was talking too fast, that she couldn't even say, he just called me a fat ass. Don't worry, they're not making fun of you for not eating the rabbit. That could have happened. And if it couldn't, then the family's the asshole. Like, that's that's kind of my point. Like, there's there's no reason why Jack should have to be hung out to dry just going, I have no idea what's going on right now. And I'm assuming that it's me because I'm neurotic. And there are points in the movie where him being out of the loop is just mean to him. Like the part in the cab where she's arguing with the yes. cab driver and he's left there wondering, like, what the hell is going on? Why are you two so heated? And he's not being cued into what's happening. And again, when she's yelling at the guy in the restaurant, it's like her impulsivity and her anger shows just a lack of respect for him. And 
there were multiple points in this movie where I'm like, dude, get out. Red flags are red flags in every language. Like, get the fuck out of there. She's clearly not who you want to be with. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was one of the most frustrating parts of the movie was after the restaurant fight when that's that's the impetus of the whole actual fight and breaking down and and kind of coming clean to a point. But the fact that she continues to defend her actions in the restaurant by saying he did very bad things like three or four times. It's like, just say the bad thing. Like, I, I don't understand why you think that this is making a case for yourself by not telling him what's actually going on. So I just realized, I think the reason why I was a little bit more on the side of Marion in this whole thing <laughs> is because the lead up to that, the lead up to that fight, obviously there was the whole cab driver thing. And she she was trying to explain like th- he was being racist, whatever. Uh, and she was trying to protect him. But like the lead up to that, he was already casting doubts, but wasn't communicating those doubts to her. And obviously she wasn't helping that whatsoever, but she was still being herself. And then she was meeting these exes and she's trying to like make everyone at peace to get through these two days. And so I felt like because he also didn't try to communicate his feelings, it just continued and built up to that big fight. And so I'm not saying that Jack, you're at fault of this. (laughs) It's just that that's why I didn't really have a lot of sympathy for him because he didn't bring anything up in a meaningful way in a relationship. I do not mean in in any way to say that this is a one sided. Who is the problem? Who are we cheering for? Oh, right. So I, I said that right up front. So, yeah, Jack absolutely did not help add any reassurances that he should be the good guy or that I should feel bad for him. But just how it kind of started mounting like that's those were kind of some of the things that I was taking away from it. But you're, you're totally right that he was not blameless at all. But I just had my mind blown by something you had said about her meeting all of her exes. I want this movie to be Scott Pilgrim. <laughs> mm. I would totally watch right? Adam Goldberg going through Paris, fighting all of Marion's seven evil exes. there are a couple things that they bring up early in this movie that i thought would have greater significance to the story as it went along that never really came to fruition black mold no not black mold (laughs) i really thought that this was going to end with one of them dying from black mold poisoning (laughs) specifically i'm talking about the marion being special and different as a youngster and her seeing the world differently and hearing things like that never really came back into play or explained her behavior later in the movie. Like I thought maybe I I had to go back and watch that scene to be like, maybe her behavior in the end and in the middle is explained by her, her specialness, but it's not, it's, it's completely disconnected, but it feels like it's trying to explain away what we're about to see. I think I can explain why. Go ahead. And I don't agree with this necessarily, but in the very beginning, they explain that she's different and that her mother always supported her and refused getting medication. Mm. And one of the things that they say in that that big argument, Jack tells her, this is a problem. You need to be on medication. Mm. Yeah, that's true. It's very flippant. Yes. And so I don't know if that's like exactly the tie in, but that's that's how I kind of interpreted the the introduction of how she was as a kid and i think something else that escalated their problems the tension between the two was you remember that one part what i i loved it when it flipped through all of jack's photos that he took in every location that they were at like he just like constantly was taking photos and there were parts in it where you got a quick flash of marion just being exasperated That was her solution to her specialness or problem that she was going through as a young lady. And I think that watching your partner and kind of like use that and kind of not just experience the moment with you, maybe there was some stuff there, but a lot of that maybe just be hidden and I'm just like reading into things too much, but it was definitely a thought. And that was another reason why I was just kind of angry at Jack for a lot of the movie. Mm-hmm. No, I think that's a really good point. And, and that I don't know if I should be reading into this feeling, I think was intentional. 
because oh, okay. they explain as a youth, she stared at things for too long. So her mom gave her a camera so that she didn't have to stare at them. She could just take a picture. And then in the narration, Marion says that if you're taking pictures of things, you're not in the moment. So on this trip, I didn't take any pictures. And then she had this like anger towards Jack, the fact that he did take pictures. So I still don't know exactly how to interpret that because it feels like it goes right, both ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it kind of feels like, well, that's how Marion copes with things. And now she's mad at other people for doing it. But maybe she really wished she could have taken the pictures, but wanted to be in the moment. And Well, there were a few times where she was taking photos and he was taking photos of her taking photos. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I, I get what you're saying. It's just a I think it added a layer of complexity that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. And, and that was the minor one. The major one that I feel is brought up and never really touched on is the small world theory that he talks about where, you know, you go across oh. to the other side of the world and you run into someone, you know, only I feel like they're trying to apply that to her running into her exes in her own hometown, which would be like right. the opposite of small world theory. Like, <laughs> Should you not expect to run into people, you know, in the town you were from? It is Paris. <laughs> like, so. Yeah, but it's in the neighborhood she lives in in Paris. Yeah. No, I, I totally agree. And and they they pretty much like paint that pretty clearly where it says like, oh, you know, that that small world theory that I had. Well, see, I feel like that's now with just your exes. So like they they actually do say that in the movie. Right. Which I felt it was was a giant leap to what what I think is an interesting theory and one that you could probably build an entire movie around Definitely. is that idea of the small world theory. But I just feel like they they touched upon it because it was something intellectual for a conversation and then didn't really play it out as it deserved. It was like they had to give Jack an intellectual part because mm -hmm. earlier he had kind of fallen asleep snoring when she was giving her theory around <laughs> genetics and different, what was it, allergies or something? I don't even remember, but it, it just was silly. Parents and immune systems and how immune systems dictate like whether or not parents should be together and have children. But that that does lead to one of my favorite lines in the movie, which is uh, Jack saying to Marion, it's like dating public television. I know. In describing I her. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't she say, is that a bad thing? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and, and that's what I really liked about the relationship at first. But then it just started to spiral out of control. The tension got to the point of ridiculous outcomes. Mm hmm. Like, I don't know if, if this is the appropriate time to bring it up, but what the hell was up with the guy who smoked out the fast food joint? Thank you. That, that was literally the one question I had written down is what was with the fairy? I wrote the exact uh, same <laughs> question. And then you see him just dancing at a at a music, like a live performance right after that, at, like on the street. Like, God, what a left field thing. I went back and watched that scene because I wanted to figure out what the hell his role in this movie was. And all I can think of is it's just another example of the French people being weird in this movie. <laughs> like there's the guy on the subway who's just like up in their business for no reason. Or the, the taxi cab driver that says, oh, uh, he won't give you a baby. And she says, no, I don't want to. And he goes, nah, that's not true. All women want to have babies. If he won't give it to you, I will. I make great babies. You want a Brad Pitt? Right. Was, and oh. actually, uh, thank you for bringing this up because I totally forgot about those scenes. And I think it's just because I just wanted to ignore the discomfort I was feeling mm -hmm. <laughs> because I felt like Jack wasn't doing anything specifically in, like he was trying in the subway. He really was trying. But like, I don't know. And obviously he couldn't understand what this other asshole was saying in a taxi cab. But I still felt like, fuck, I always get that those kinds of icky feelings as a woman. And obviously, she was trying not to subject him to those icky feelings as well. That, at least that's what was going on through my head. No, I, I agree with that. And part of that subway scene was also Jack hates the subway and he did not want to go on it. So right. the fact that that kind of happened and it kind of justified his his feelings was also kind of funny. But that cab driver who hits on her, he says, you look like Catherine Zeta-Jones. <laughs> And when she tells Jack that, Jack's response is, great, we have a blind cab driver. <laughs> yeah. And to go back to the subway thing, that was one of my favorite parts was when he doesn't know what to do. We can't communicate at all. This guy's obviously getting in their personal space. So he just kind of looks at Marion and then like furls his eyebrows. Is that how you say it? And and just like stares the guy for like two seconds and quickly turns back to Mary it's and goes, not working. that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and those were the times that I was still kind of like on his side, but you know, it just that it felt so superficial to me with with him. Like he wasn't actually trying to do more than what he was doing in the movie. And I don't know, maybe I'm just reading into things. But obviously their relationship in my opinion did not work out. Interesting. So you don't think because I'm going to say this, the ending narration had me really confused about how this movie ended. Right. And it's in the last two or three lines. And she says, there's a moment in life where you can't recover anymore from another breakup. And even if this person bugs you 60% of the time, well, you still can't live without him. And even if he wakes up every day by sneezing right in your face, while well, you love his sneezes more than anyone else's kisses. That line reading made me feel like they stay together. Yeah, but I didn't think their relationship worked out. Oh, well, I, I can say because there's a sequel, it does not work out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but as far as the way this movie ends, it felt like they choose to stay together. Right. And almost, I, almost out of just being beaten down by life. Yes. And not for any other good reason. I think the last major scene where they were kind of in the throes of a breakup and they're both really emotional. And we have the entire narration from Marion's perspective. I was getting the feeling that this is the first time they have had a real conversation. And they didn't realize how difficult it was going to fucking be. And she said something about it being four hours long. And I'm going, duh, of course. You've never talked about any of this shit before. And it's all coming to a head because you've maybe traveled for the first time together. And you're figuring this shit out together. So, yes, I do think at the end of the movie they're together, but I, you know, yes, sequel wise, they don't stay together. But even just fundamentally, they're not going to stay together. Yeah, I think that in that last scene, I really enjoyed the way that it played out because it starts with Marion saying, I don't let people break up with me because it's too hard to hear them finish it. So I always do it first. But then that's so I don't know. That just resonated with me so much. <laughs> like, I, I've never broken up with anyone before. I've always, like, someone's broken up with me or they've, like, texted me or something. <laughs> but, yeah, it. I remember just the feeling, though, that emptiness between the breakup while you're waiting and thinking and processing and you're trying to, like, not express the the sadness and, like, oh, God, this is this is the end. I, I understood what she meant by that. Yeah, but I, I thought it was really interesting because they they didn't, they don't ever have her actually say it. The next visual we get after her saying that is what looks like Jack more tearful than he had been already. So like it kind of implies that she just said, let's end it. But then it continues to go on. And then the the lines that Ben said and Jack starts to do these goofy faces and they're smiling at each other. So I don't know if that means that that breakup line happened when she would have dumped him. But then they continued to work through it. I got the impression she said, like, she brought up the words break up. Like, should we break up? That was the impression I got. Sorry to interrupt. I'd, no, I'd agree with that. Yeah. Yep. I felt like in the that end narration and specifically the beginning part of it, Marion almost as the narrator, she takes no responsibility for her, her ra irrational or erratic behavior and feels like she hasn't done anything wrong. And I feel like that end narration then kind of makes the movie off putting because the narrator is someone you, you want to get behind and you want to support. But when the, the narrator can't even see their own faults, it, it's hard to root for that person. I identified with her and it's because. Because you're irrational. Because I'm irrational. Yes, 100 uh, <laughs> percent. I will agree with that. But because of my own mental health that I've struggled with for years when she is sitting there crying, there was that whole like cheating arc that she wasn't actually cheating, but there were messages. It was hella confusing and I did not understand any of it, but she's sitting there crying uncontrollably, not understanding her own emotions and what she's going through. And so she comes to this realization that she needs to be with this person, Jack, that she loves him and has to be with him because She's having this intense emotional reaction to whatever is going on. And so I felt that the narration for herself was maybe a how she was coping, honestly. Like, mm. like, and that's how I got it. I didn't I didn't love it, but that's how I was feeling as I was watching the end. Yeah. 
Did anyone have any favorite uh, scenes, shots, lines that we haven't talked about yet? I mean, I, I mentioned it before. Wow. The quick cuts of all of their photos, just like the hundreds that Jack had taken showing little snapshots. They were so quick and they were really fun for me to see the dynamic between the two of them. And so that was one of my favorite parts. Yeah. Th- that first 12 minutes, th- there was a lot of interesting filmmaking choices mm-hmm. and a lot of interesting editing choices that went away after that. And I, I was a little disappointed because I wanted to see more of that type of style. Same. The very opening shot of the movie, sadly, was my favorite shot of the movie. So it was all downhill from there. Can you remind us what that is? I yeah. don't remember. The opening shot is of them laying in bed on the train and there's oh, the gun right. on her shirt pointed at him. And it's almost like it's it's showing you like she is a loaded weapon that is pointed directly at Jack and she is going to go off in this movie and he better be prepared. So I thought there was a lot of symbolism, just, just that opening shot. And I really, really liked it. Did not notice the gun on her shirt, but that's pretty darn cool. I've already said a couple of my favorite quotes, but here's one that we haven't talked about. I'm American. My first religion is private property. <laughs> I, there were some really great Jack lines, but even just like the family, they had some really fun things that they said that a lot of times I didn't I didn't pick up very quickly. But I think, as you brought up, there was some weird erotic thing that the dad was into. But I, I loved the gallery. I loved every second of the gallery. I thought it was so obscure and bizarre. And I, I just I loved it. It was so silly. Right before that line that you just said, Wesley. Jack is talking to Manu, who is uh, Marion's old boyfriend, and Manu is talking about how Hitler would have put him in a concentration camp, even though his mom wasn't Jewish. Right. And Jack's response is, yeah, I never really liked camp. (laughs) (laughs) This movie had a lot of Hitler references, by the way. Yes. Like a weird amount. And I I don't know what that was about. It was like the French are obsessed with Hitler or something. <laughs> well, Adam Goldberg is is Jewish, isn't he? Yep, he is. But still, it, it was just like four or five of these like very obvious Hitler references. And I'm like, what? I don't know. I feel like that's just maybe also because of Adam Goldberg, because I think he brings that to a lot of his his writing and acting roles. As a counterpoint to that. It just being Adam Goldberg, and that's why it's being mentioned. There is a lot of xenophobia brought up in this movie. Uh, yes. That's true. Just about him looking like an Arab or the Hitler stuff. Like, So I think it's it's almost a commentary just on where French culture was in 2007. And it's, they were and kind of focused today, on this. And a little bit, too. Is it still like that? So I've been listening to some other podcasts. If you're interested, anyone out there, The Stooped is a really great episode all about being a black man in France and how a lot Mm. of black Americans wanted to move to France because there's no racism, essentially. And so it is interesting to hear a lot of the different problems that people of color in Europe go through, a lot of things that you wouldn't quite expect because Europe likes to paint this picture of we're just not going to talk about it. So that that is definitely really interesting. Plus, a lot of immigrant populations have increased in a lot of Europe countries in the last 10 years. And so it, it is really interesting to think about that connection that, oh, yeah, that's true. You know, there it's not just America. That's the racist pieces of shit. <laughs> right. Did anyone else get Curb Your Enthusiasm vibes from the very beginning of the movie? I don't know what that is. Specifically in the way that it was kind of shot with these wide shots and the and the the handheld camera, him talking to the American tourists and giving them directions. And then I'm like, okay, they're definitely coming back at the end. Oh, and yeah. I thought for sure that that, that Curb Your Enthusiasm music was going to drop. Yeah, just a, a lot of Curb Your Enthusiasm vibes with it. Yeah, as soon as I saw Julie Delpy, I honestly couldn't see or hear anything other than the before trilogy, mm-hmm. which isn't necessarily bad. But now that you do mention that, like, yeah, that whole conversation with the Bush Cheney Americans mm-hmm. and especially when Marion comes back and it's like, what do you do? And he's like, 
I told him to go away and, and you know, maybe instead go of... Go to the Louvre over there. Yeah, maybe <laughs> instead of going to see the Louvre, they'll, they'll see a real riot and actually get uh, radicalized to some real politics. And she goes, that's so mean, but so good. And then <laughs> they kiss. And so, like, maybe that just discredits the whole argument that we were having about, like, why they aren't shouldn't be in a relationship at all. Like, they, they obviously have some very strong point of views about things and, and are willing to hurt other people for their I was gonna views. say radicalize but yeah that, that's a good point like hurt other people if they don't have the same views right and also to get ahead in the line of taxis <laughs> yeah just so you don't have to get on the subway and you know this movie I've, I've never seen the before trilogy and i do i do love a lot of sorry wesley i love sub subtitles i just i love foreign films and it's obviously just a this... joke i try to act like i'm dumber than i really am <laughs> But I will say the quirkiness of the beginning, a lot of the interesting editing choices, it did remind me a lot of Amelie mm -hmm. and just like the focus on the female characters being primarily important in the beginning. And obviously it changed throughout. But once we got like maybe 20, 25 minutes in, it kind of shifted to something I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I don't watch a lot of dramas, but it just felt like a lot of real life trauma of arguing with my exes or something. <laughs> yeah, I think I read I read an, a review that called it Amelie Hall, which is a mixture of Amelie and Annie Hall, which I, I think is, is Hall pretty is. fitting. It's a Woody Allen movie. So neurotic Jewish character and free spirited woman kind of partnered together. OK, so speaking of like the free spirited woman trope, you know how a lot of times it, the movies are focused on the man and the woman is the manic pixie dream girl. Mm -hmm. I felt like this kind of now, just because you brought that up, I, I feel like this kind of said, fuck you to that kind of um, trope in a sense, if that makes sense. I think they matched. So, uh, and this again goes back to the midnight trilogies because I think that Julie Delpy does kind of come across in some aspects, like the manic pixie dream girl in especially before sunrise the first one where she's just this out there crazy girl with all these wild ideas and and I'm just this american traveler who's trying to experience europe and and let's talk about existentialism so like i felt a lot of this movie was more matching the out there quirky characters like the two of them match yeah. each other so oh, okay. i i think that her manic pixie dream girl, if it had not been paired with a neurotic Adam Goldberg, like if this was Ethan Hawke again, or, you know, imagine Bruce Willis in this role. What? She would have come across <laughs> as wild. She would have been manic pixie dream girl. But because her co-star was Adam Goldberg, I think it it just isn't uh, as upfront. Well, maybe it's him, but I think also just the writing itself, just yeah. like oh, yeah, his sure. character, the, the character himself, too. Yeah. yeah. And I want to push back on her being a manic pixie dream girl and before sunrise, because I don't think that that's the case at all, because she's given her own agency and her own right. character and they're given kind of equal footing. It's not to help the man along discover himself or redefine himself. It's, it's right. about each of them individually and then as a couple. Sure. What do we think overall, though? Like. I mean, I I enjoyed it. I don't think I'll watch it again, but it was a pretty solid movie. Mm -hmm. I thought it was an interesting take on the genre. It is not something I would ever watch again, uh, just because of how angry the last 35 to 40 minutes made me, mm -hmm. just as, as we kind of lose the sense of character that was developed in the beginning. Right. I would agree with that. I was on a roller coaster this entire movie. <laughs> I started liking it. I hated it. I liked it. I was like, this is stupid. This is kind of funny. I agree. I think I think it was decent. I don't know if anybody needs to see it. It didn't add anything mm -hmm. to me. It, did, it didn't challenge any of my my ideals or thoughts about anything. Oh, it challenged me a lot on a, a lot of different things in like past relationships, actually. Well, that's because I, I live thinking in the, about the future. <laughs> But no, I, I would also probably not watch this again just because I am non-confrontational as much as possible. And this movie was pretty much 100% arguments. So I did not really <laughs> enjoy watching people fight about things that I have no stake in. I think Wesley and I need to get into a debate. 
I think we will do that very soon. <laughs> uh, one thing we didn't even talk about is the acting in this movie. Like, I, I thought the acting was really solid throughout. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. I really enjoyed the acting too, Ben. Especially the mom and dad. Oh, cool. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. This has been Two Days in Paris. If you'd like to reach out to us, uh, you can reach out to us on email, idrinkyourpodcast at gmail.com. We are also on Twitter at IDYP underscore podcast and at Instagram under the same handle. Handle. Ooh, good word. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank you for listening thus far. Share us with a friend or two, subscribe, rate, and check us out next week. As next week, we will be... Calendar math. So the the next episode, yeah, calendar math in the brain real quick. (laughs) The episode coming out Tuesday will be Wild Hogs with Nick from Gleam in the Tube. So check us out and thank you for listening and we'll see you later. I definitely thought you were going to say Two Days in Paradise when when you were saying the title again. (laughs) Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.